It is an extraordinary pleasure for me to introduce Adam Gopnik. Um, we all know him from his articles in The New Yorker, his um, political analysis, his reviews. Um, we don't know him as I do as a Montreal Canadiens fan <laughs> who uh, left Montreal in the early 1980s um, and made a decision that he was going to be a writer. When his father dropped him off with his new wife, he gave him, his father gave him, a wonderful piece of advice. He said, never underestimate the other person's insecurities. No matter who it is. And I suspect his father already knew this, but I am going to assert that that piece of advice and that sensibility of not underestimating other people's insecurities is at least part of the answer why this man is probably the most generous reviewer, the most generous analyst, and therefore among the most beloved writers we have in America. He's written numerous essays and reviews, but it's always the book reviews, I have to say, I feel particularly drawn to. Not just because of the close reading, but because of the obvious attention he knows the author has paid to the subject. And the generosity of the review is always a reflection of the hard work he knows the author has done to produce a book. And so when you read Adam's reviews, not only do you get an analysis and an essay, because every book he reads is an occasion for a wonderful essay, but you also get probably the most interesting and full exp exposition of the book's basic thesis. It's just a privilege to read him. And you've saved me from having to read a lot of books. <laughs> um, Adam has won three national magazine awards for criticism and reviewing. He's the author of a children's novel, which I've read to my children, highly recommend it, through The King, the King in the Window. He's written a wonderful memoir of his young family's life in Paris, Paris to the Moon. He's written a book about Darwin and Lincoln, whom you would not ordinarily think of in the same breath. But after you get finished with Adam's book, you think that they were brothers from another mother. <laughs> um, he's written about. Food, the table comes first. He's written about winter, which, coming from Montreal as I do, was a particular favorite of mine. Um, and his last memoir, At the Stranger's Gate, Arrivals in New York, is a wonderful, evocative memoir of New York in the 1980s. His last book, A Thousand Small Sanities, is an effort in the age of Trump to deal not with Trump, but with the precious, unlikely achievement called our liberal democracy, which is at risk. And with that, I'm going to leave Adam to fill you in on the rest, and we will talk after he's done. <laughs> Thank you, Bernie. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you, Bernie. Uh, a dear friend and a paisan, I think even us Jews can say, uh, fellow Montrealer, I should explain it right away that my affection for the Montreal Canadiens is not a transitory or secondary one, but is the dominant passion of my life. <laughs> and my son, who was brought up in Paris and then in New York with this uh, monopoly on, on righteous thinking, that is the Montreal <laughs> Canadiens, uh, has now crossed over the Iron Curtain and is going to school doing his, his graduate work at Brandeis in Boston. And every day he calls me to tell me about how the orcs gather at every street corner to root on the Bruins. Uh, it's a sign of the kinds of sacrifices we're prepared to make in our family for the sake of higher education <laughs> that he has gone there. I should add also that uh, Bernie is absolutely right in saying that that was what my father said to me as we boarded the bus to New York City. But I should add that that wisdom, uh, uh, never underestimate the other person's insecurities, had been hard won by him from 15 years as the Dean of Arts at McGill. Um, it, was, it spoke to his experience of department chairman in particular. It is a joy to be back here at Dartmouth again. Uh, I come here under even more false pretenses than in my previous visits. I have been here to speak on food and I have been here to speak at various conferences on France and the future of France, two subjects about which I am amateur. Uh, but today I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the themes and the addendums I would offer to my most recent book, which is indeed a political book and a kind of credo for a particular kind of liberal thought and uh, a manifesto for what I imagine is the future of liberalism. All of these subjects, the history of liberalism, the nature of political economy, are ones which make my expertise on food in France look absolute by comparison. <laughs> Nonetheless, I was compelled, I felt compelled to write this book because of the national and indeed global emergency in which we all find ourselves right now. It was motivated particularly by my daughter Olivia, who was 17 on the night of the 2016 election, and who I saw truly, literally, as she was saying, literally having become a, a generational, um, someone recognizes this adverb for really, really, really a lot. She was literally, yes, trembling, freaked out by the result. And I took her outside. <laughs> and uh, we went on a long walk around our New York neighborhood. And I tried to reassure her by uh, affirming the values of liberal humanism that I had been brought up in, that I had hoped that uh, we had passed on to her, lifting her spirits with uh, historical examples, reminding her of how much the abstract lessons of the history she was being taught in school would now apply immediately to her life, inculcating in her the idea that all values rise from the ground up, not from the top down, reminding her that Barack Obama had not been making her sandwiches every morning for eight years, I had and would continue to. <laughs> and all of these words had the same effect on my 17-year-old daughter as all such paternal words have on all seven-year-old daughters, and that is none at all of any kind. And in fact, I soon saw that she was consulting her phone as I spoke <laughs> for texts of reassurance from her friends. OMFG, OMFG, Olivia, OMFG. <laughs> Nonetheless, I made a mental note that I would someday, and someday soon, write a letter to my daughter on liberalism. And the book, uh, A Thousand Small Sanities, is that. But I was compelled to its tone and its uh, manner, I think, as much by my own uh, sense of something approaching despair as by my own desire to reassure my wonderful daughter. Um, someone once said, that we all have the philosophy of our insomnia. Uh, I am not sure who said it, and I am beginning to suspect that it may be me, uh, <laughs> because it certainly sounds French, and I, for a while I thought that Cyrin, the great Romanian French aphorist, might have said it, because he was certainly an insomniac, and he was also a philosopher. But I cannot find it anywhere. It sounds like the sort of thing Camus might have grumbled through a cigarette at one time or another, but it doesn't seem to belong to Camus. Uh, I will. Uh, hesitantly, and I'm sure someone in this room can properly place it, but I will hesitantly claim it with the gloss on it, on what it means that what we really 
care about are the things we think about at 3 a.m. At 3 p.m., uh, we can talk about uh, rising prices, uh, ad admissions policies to Ivy League schools, uh, the fate of the Montreal Canadiens, and indeed of the Boston Bruins, if we so choose. But those are 3 p.m. subjects. What really matters for us is those things that haunt us at 3 a.m., those basic existential and historical fears. And the philosophy of my insomnia always turns around the survival of liberal civilization, what I think of as liberal cities. I've written, as Bernie says quite rightly, on a huge number of subjects in my 30 plus years at The New Yorker. But when I review them, they're all tied together by that common thread. What is liberal civilization? What are the values of liberal humanist civilization? And how they can, can they be sustained? That was the theme of my book about Paris, the great modern city and uh, in crisis, in perpetual crisis. Now as well, it was as much the theme of my book on food, which was much more about the rituals of the table and how they had grown than it was a collection of recipes that you could uh, reproduce in your own kitchen. What fascinated me were the institutions, the semi-private and yet public institutions of the cafe and the restaurant and the dining table that had acted as such a powerful adhesive in modern liberal society. Call it bourgeois society, and I won't argue with you, but I will bracket that term for a later discussion. Um, and yet, those values that we call and encapsulate perhaps too neatly or in too summary a way as liberal democratic values are clearly under assault now in a way that they have not been, I think, in even in the lifetime of the oldest person in this room, in a way that they have not been really since the 19. 30s. <laughs> I was looking at Bernie, actually. <laughs> and I don't need to enumerate for this audience all of those attacks or from whence they come or why they come. They come from both right and left, but above all from this sudden and unexpected and yet seemingly fatal rise of uh, classic right-wing authoritarian nationalism, which has placed liberalism under a kind of daily assault in Britain, throughout Eastern Europe, in Hungary, and in Turkey, and most alarmingly, because in some ways most surprisingly here in the United States, and most perniciously because most uh, uh, violently in lots of ways, and mo with the, the most violent rhetoric. And so I wrote this book. And of course, one of the possible responses to this book was to say that it was um, celebrating something that had already passed, celebrating a defunct tradition. I spoke about the philosophy of one's insomnia, which is something that we all share. To the philosophy of insomnia that all thinking people share, writers have the very special codicil on the philosophy of their insomnia, which is the letters they write to their reviewers at 3 a.m. They worry about. <laughs> the future of the world, and then they write letters to the reviewer. And the person who suffers most in this particular exchange is the sleeping spouse, who is <laughs> given a gentle nudge, perhaps by people in this room, and said, uh, darling, are you awake? <laughs> At that moment, you can offer this wonderful, uncelebrated literary genre. I will not recite for you my, my 3 AM insomniac letters, but I will say that one of the responses that uh, those of us who speak up for the values of liberal democracy and of liberal humanism regularly receive <coughs> is that we are defending a defunct creed, a creed that right or wrong, good or bad, has passed its historical moment, is in the process of being replaced, and no longer, for good or ill, has urgency or moment in public discourse. I was pleased, therefore, <coughs> to be reminded that indeed it does, and of a very urgent kind, by uh, a man who uh, those of us who are scoring debating points will therefore look on as a hero, and that is Vladimir Putin. <laughs> because you will recall that earlier this year, Putin, when pressed by the Financial Times about where he stood, singled out the values of liberalism as exactly the thing that he thought was the were the most pernicious in Europe. And the values by the values of liberalism, he did not mean the values of the free market, which he clearly uh, esteems in their kleptocratic form in Russian, nor really did he mean uh, the values of social democracy, which in a debased form he still takes part in. He meant specifically and emphatically 
the values of compassion which have underlied the humanist project, at least since the time of Montaigne and the Renaissance. He singled out as the thing he most despised Angela Merkel's uh, rescue and welcome of Syrian refugees into Germany. That was the liberalism that Vladimir Putin hates, that Vladimir Putin despises and believes has to be replaced by a, a hard-hearted uh, ethnic nationalism of the kind he practices. And you will recall that when Putin attacked Western liberalism, his acolyte, our own president, said, and I wish that I were making this up, said, yes, he agreed with him that Western liberalism was defunct. You only had to look at Los Angeles and San Francisco and how badly they were being governed to see how weak Western liberalism was. He meant, by the West, he meant California, and he assumed <laughs> that Putin was also attacking the liberalism evident in California. Same values, not as bright. <laughs> uh, so clearly, those values are still worth enumerating and indeed defending because they are exactly what the uh, enemies of liberalism still regard as potent and pernicious in their potency. Um, and at the same time, we've seen just in the last few months the uh, students in Hong Kong protesting and rioting on behalf not of increased enhanced economic opportunity, which they could clearly find in uh, mainland China and communist China as well, but exactly on behalf of those, uh, the rule of law and on behalf of those liberal institutions which they inherited from a colonial regime, as it happens, but which nonetheless still seemed to them uh, worth uh, protesting for, indeed risking their lives for, the simple idea that the government and the judiciary, the boss and the cops, should be separate people, and the cops should not always uh, answer to the boss. The simple idea of the rule of law, but a very powerful one, and one that clearly exists independent in their minds of the specific economic opportunities or the economic agendas of Hong Kong or China, and as I say, significantly, in one way, simply a uh, colonial uh, outcropping, a colonial legacy, nonetheless clearly of enormous value to the people who see the threat of it being uh, eliminated or deprived. So in that way, it seemed to me clear that liberal institutions remain at the center of everything that we're arguing about, that far from being uh, peripheral or par far from being uh, neatly dated or left behind, they are what the contemporary fight, what the contemporary world battle, what the world's insomnia turns around in the year 2019. So the question then is, can you enumerate those liberal institutions? And it's one of the things I try and do in this book. Uh, and of course, there are the ones that were taught in every social studies class, in every fifth grade social studies class, and they are obviously important. Uh, parliamentary democracy, uh, legislative choice, free expression, uh, free press, a relatively free media, if we can have it, uh, an acceptance as a premise, uh, perhaps as important as any other, that the oscillation of power between political parties is not toxic, but essential and to be accepted. A whole bunch of, strictly speaking, political uh, institutions and beliefs. But at the same time, let me get my water here. Uh, those strictly political institutions, which are the core of the idea of liberalism as it's taught at most universities and most colleges like this one, there's a whole secondary set of attitudes and non-political institutions that are just as essential for liberal democracy and the values of liberal humanism to propagate and survive. And my book is devoted in part to celebrating and uh, articulating what those other values and what those other intermediate institutions might be. Some of the values are easily dismissed as tonal or temperamental. And one of the things that I feel strongly about is that the tonal and temperamental side of liberalism and of liberal democratic institutions is in some ways as important as their formal and procedural side. Uh, liberalism has been, since the time of Montaigne, very much a question of temperament and tone, a willingness to accept all of our shared failability, a readiness to entertain opposing positions, an even more important readiness to enter as empathetically as we can into the minds and arguments of those 
who oppose us with uh, the notion certainly of refuting them, but also of embracing the possibility of a broader view that might come to us from someone who begins with a very different premise about the world. Those are all uh, temperamental habits, temperamental tonal tendencies that are, I think, very much part of the liberal tradition. It's why I begin this book uh, not with uh, Locke or with uh, Montesquieu or any of the other uh, places where a, a proper and appropriately credentialed uh, academic political scientist would begin it, but instead with the moment which I wanted to share with Olivia and show her of John Stuart Mill and Harriet Taylor outside the rhinoceros cage of the London Zoo in the 1830s. You all know the story of the Mill's romance. I hope gentleman does not. Well, <laughs> John Stuart Mill, the greatest of all liberal philosophers, I think without question, uh, fell in love in the 1830s at a memorable London dinner party with a wonderful and gifted woman named Harriet Taylor, who was already married to a pharmacist and had three children already. And they immediately had a kind of mind lock and indeed a heart lock. Uh, and they began a clandestine romance, which would stretch out over uh, a very long time. And they used to meet clandestinely uh, in front of the rhinoceros cage at the London Zoo. The rhinoceros had entered the London Zoo only in 1826. It was the first rhinoceros anywhere, I believe, in Europe. Oh, no, there was a French rhinoceros. Of course there was a French rhinoceros <laughs> first. Um, but it was the first British adopted rhinoceros. And they would send each other notes. We could meet at 3, 8, 3 p.m. in front of our old friend Rhino. Uh, they, uh, and they would meet. And they had had the wonderful acuity that only great philosophers can have, uh, which is that everyone would be looking at the Rhino, and no one would be looking at the courting couple <laughs> On the, uh, on the bench outside it. Uh, they were tormented in many ways because she was married and wanted to honor her marriage. She felt her husband was inadequate, but she loved her children. She eventually nursed him through a horrible death by cancer before she was finally freed to marry Mill. Whether or not they had an actual romantic uh, exchange before that, no one knows for certain. Um, scholars all insist that they didn't, but they went to Paris for a week together. <laughs> and it is my theory that no cup courting couple goes to Paris and shares a hotel for a week together in what used to be called a completely innocent way. Nonetheless, Mill always said about Harriet Taylor that she was the smartest person he'd ever known, the greatest mind he'd ever lived with, and the greatest teacher that he ever had. And in the incurably sexist way of most uh, scholarship, most Mill scholars for 100 years said, oh, it, what they did is, uh, is they essentially yokoed Harriet to make up a verb. They said, John was so crazy in love with her that he imagined that she was wildly gifted. Uh, fortunately, fortunately, it might be true in the other case. Fortunately, the last 30 years of feminist scholarship has revealed to us what John Stuart Mill had been telling us all along, that she was a woman of extraordinary intellectual gifts and confidences. On that bench in front of the rhino's cage, they hatched together the ideas for those two foundational tones of the liberal temperament and of liberal thought. Uh, Mill having the impetus for uh, On Liberty, the greatest single a statement of the necessity of personal autonomy of our right, not only to personal expression, which is, of course, one of the famous uh, takeaways from Mill's book, but even more important for our, of our duty to personal fulfillment, the idea that we, are, we cannot be uh, entire as human beings unless we are free to express ourselves in every uh, imaginable way, unless we're free to make music, write poetry, uh, become, the per become the largest self we possibly can be. That's the liberty that Mill had in mind as much as the liberty essential for political dialogue and the advancement of human progress. But at the same time, as Mill was crafting that great statement about the necessity of human liberty, Harriet Taylor was feeding him, conversing in front of the rhinoceros cage with her ideas on the necessity of what we now rightly call women's liberation. And those ideas that would lead to that great statement on the subjugation of women uh, not merely for a modified or muted equality uh, of the 
of the sexes, not merely for women's ever greater participation in the social sphere, but for the absolute equality of men and women in every imaginable sphere, economic, political, social, artistic, uh, that one could find. I, I was just reading Mill's letters um, by my bedside the other day. I grant you, it's sad. But <laughs> I was, and I come, came across a letter which I had never seen where Mill is writing to someone about the fight for what's being called at that period in Britain, manhood suffrage, which means the universal suffrage, means the suffrage of the working classes as well. So it's something Mill is in favor of, but he stops and lectures and says, we cannot call it manhood suffrage because manhood suffrage is inherently discriminatory. We have to call it universal suffrage or we leave out women, even if they can't be included at this point, it implies that our dream of enfranchisement ends with men, something that Taylor and Mill felt passionately about in a way that we still have yet to fulfill. So what, the reason I began with that moment with Mill and Taylor and the Rhino is exactly because those two enterprises, on the one hand, the insistence on the power and passion of autonomy, and on the other, the search for social equality, where were in their minds, and to my mind, this is the central originality of the liberal tradition we inherit, were not in any way contradictory. Each was essential to the other. The dream of social equality through active political reform and the assertion of individual autonomy through unhindered personal liberty, they imagined on that bench in front of the rhinoceros cage as part of a single and essential human project. That for me is the liberalism that we inherit. That's the way we use liberal when we're using it in our everyday speech. And that's the values, the tone, the temperament. One, both of a welcome compromise, the Mills, John and Harriet live their life in a state of painful compromise between her demands as a mother and a wife, his love for her, their love for each other. They accepted the necessity of compromise as part of the living fabric of human existence, a compromise not as a lesser centrism, but as a knot tied tight between competing decencies. That was the temperamental essence of their vision and one applied to their political projects. That's one way in which the temperament of liberalism is essential to my sense of it. But there's another, and I think perhaps even richer sense, in which the non-political institutions of liberal democracies are essential for supporting enabling, ennobling, and carrying their mission forward. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean simply that one of the remarkable discoveries, both by historians and sociologists in the past 60 years, has been the central role that uh, non-political institutions, what we now call generically social capital plays in creating the possibility of liberal democracy. It was the great insight of Adam Smith and David Hume that if there is not a spark of social sympathy, passing between peoples. If we don't have the capacity to work in conditions of trust with people who are not of our blood or clan or kind, then the institutions of liberal democracy will be null. They will be uh, ineffective. That sounds terribly abstract when you say it, but it's something that's been demonstrated empirically and historically again and again. The crucial role of the coffee house in making the French Enlightenment, of course, is one of the great burdens of uh, Jürgen Habermas's sociology and of his, his vision. That was the, the idea that the Enlightenment was made not in courts, but in coffee houses, not simply because subversive ideas were being passed from one person to another, but because the habit of conversation was constantly being enhanced. The idea that you could sit down and speak on terms of relative equality with a stranger uh, was the essential social practice that had to underlie and illuminate the political practice. Um, one of my heroes in the story of the discovery of social capital as foundational to liberal democratic practice is a somewhat surprising figure, but he plays a large role in my book as he has in a lot of my writing, and that is Frederick Law Olmsted, the great designer of Central Park. Probably the greatest sylvan landscapist in American history but what not enough no people know about him is that he was a journalist and a philosopher before he designed a single square inch of Greenland. He was a writer for the then uh, newly formed New York Times and for the then newly formed Nation magazine. And he was sent south uh, to do a report before the Civil War on the nature of, of the South. 
he wrote a book, and he had the insight that though people talked about the life of the South as though it were culturally superior, oh yes, they do keep slaves, but they have such a rich culture, people would say, and he'd say, no, they have a totally paralyzed concentration camp culture, exactly because the existence of slavery prevents anyone from living in intermediate institutions in conditions of trust and commonality with their fellow citizens. He wrote a beautiful thing, which I had hoped to uh, uh, memorize, but I have not memorized it. I will read it merely. Um, he said, in a northern community, a man who is not greatly occupied with private business is certain to become interested in social enterprises. School, road, cemetery, asylum, and church. Bridge, ferry, and water companies, literary, scientific, art, mechanical, agricultural, and benevolent societies, all these things are managed chiefly by the unpaid services of citizens during hours which they can spare from their private interests. Our citizens are members and managers of reading rooms, public libraries, gymnasiums, game clubs, boot clubs, ball clubs, and all sorts of clubs, Bible classes, debating societies, military companies, they are planting roadside trees, or damming streams for skating ponds, or rigging diving boards, or getting up fireworks displays, or private theatricals. They are always doing something. And Olmsted, before this was even remotely a common place of sociology, spotted that that was the great reservoir of northern uh, liberalism, of northern abolitionism. It was the habit not simply of meeting in political clubs, but the practice of meeting to produce whatever, fireworks, uh, with like-minded people who were not of your clan or race or class. Now, we can criticize the Olmsted's reformist generation for all of the things they failed to reform, and we should. But let's not forget that Central Park, that greatest of American architectural creations, is a testament, a living daily testament to Olmsted's vision. It is a place left open to citizens to make community for themselves. That's what Central Park exists to do, and it's what Central Park has done successfully for almost 200 years now. Social capital, community. The great uh, American sociologist Robert Putnam reiterated and, re and restated exactly Olmsted's premises when he went to Italy and studied how well or ill local government took throughout Italy when Italy uh, decentralized its government. If there were uh, opera clubs in existence, local amateur opera societies, democracy had a chance of taking. If the central institutions of the village or of the, of the commune were uh, uh, clan-based, uh, democracy had little chance of taking. This is a truth that we find again and again, that where we have powerful shared social values, literacy and education first among them, even if not directed at any obvious political end, liberal and democratic politics flourish. I had the great good fortune of going a couple of years ago in that dread year of 2016 to the remarkable little country of Iceland from whence my wife's family descends uh, to observe the presidential election there. Now there are only 300,000 people in all of Iceland. So you can imagine uh, what it's, uh, how in one way how intimate an election it is. A remarkable guy, a professor at the university, Gundi Johansson, was running for president. Uh, at, from the University of Iceland, uh, what was wonderful about it was he had a little entourage of advisors who were every bit as uh, insanely devoted to uh, meta-analysis of the data uh, as anyone here could be. So on election night, we sat together and they worried about how the artisanal ale vote in Reykjavik was going to come out <laughs> because they knew that the artisanal ale vote might be divided between two candidates, Gundi and one other. But the reason Iceland has such a thriving democracy and has survived all kinds of economic shocks in the last 15 years is because the level of social capital and social trust in Iceland is enormously high based on uh, the literacy of its inhabitants and their, uh, their habits of inclusion. One of the great musical cultures in the world, far above uh, the, uh, its number. It was something that one saw when Iceland almost won the European uh, Cup in football a few years ago when it was plain that Iceland, a country of 300,000 people, was capable of beating Britain, England, a country of 40 million people, uh, with poured enormous resources into soccer, into football, exactly because this team of amateurs had uh, uh, habits of adhesion, habits of social mucilage, common belief, shared sense of shared fate, 
that uh, enabled and empowered their amazing drive to near victory. So that seems to me something in which we are not talking about metaphysics. We're not talking about undue managerial optimism. We're talking about hard fact when we talk about the crucial role of building social capital in creating liberal democratic institutions. Olmsted had a beautiful name for that. Social capital is kind of a horrible name. He called it commonplace civilization. He said the commonplace civilization of a, of a community tells you more about their capacity to embrace democracy than the high civilization of the place ever can. That's an insight that I think only continues to grow and become more important as we think about the future and the path of liberal democracy. And one of the great questions, of course, that it opens to us is how universal, how planetary, how global can not only the numerable institutions of liberal democracy, but those underlying intermediate institutions of commonplace civilization be. Of course, many of you, I'm sure, have read Amartya Sen's remarkable studies of the way that social capital, what he calls competence, capability, work in one society after another. And Sen makes the profound point that you can find that kind of commonplace civilization, the potential for that practice of coexistence in almost every society uh, around the planet. And he enumerates at length the ways that uh, Chinese and uh, antique Indian and many other societies far removed from our own Anglo-American inheritance have exactly those same kinds of social practices which he sees as essential for their own project of self-liberation. And he says categorically that uh, what we call development is not, the, uh, uh, is not the consequence of social capital, but that uh, uh, it's a precondition of social capital, of development is to have such social capital. But that, for me, calls up a strange kind of paradox in the whole subject, which I have been brooding on and try and think about uh, in the book, but in particular in the months since I've published the book. And that is that there's a kind of paradox in the interchange of that sort of social capital, those practices of coexistence, the existence of that commonplace civilization, and our actual ability to realize those things in liberal democratic institutions. The roots of liberal democratic institutions, it seems, as Sen argues, are extremely deep and global and planetary. But the fruits of those liberal democratic institutions are very fragile and highly specific. They only blossom historically, uh, very rarely, indeed very recently, and as the history of the past two years has displayed to us, they can be eradicated with astonishing and terrifying speed. The roots are deep, and yet the fruits are fragile. Well, I suppose that describes pretty much every fruit-bearing tree in existence, does it not? That doubleness. And as a consequence, uh, it seems to me that we are caught within that paradox, within that doubleness uh, every day. We recognize the richness of those possibilities. We simultaneously recognize how precarious they are. Perhaps we don't recognize sufficiently just how precarious they are. One of the great disabilities, it seems to me, in the upbringing of my daughter, of this generation of college students, of all of us indeed, is exactly that we've become so accustomed to those extraordinarily fragile and historically specific liberal institutions that we simply believe that they will go on and persist even in the face of their violation and without our necessarily having to reinvigorate them with every passing season and indeed with every passing day. We take them entirely for granted. So the notion that the very practice of free speech, which I am enjoying today, uh, the ability to talk to you and tell you without hindrance what I think but that's a very, very special possibility, is one that we don't sufficiently value. You know, Canadian journalists crossing the border into the United States now are increasingly and routinely being asked about their political views by immigration inspectors. What do you write? What, do, what kind of thing do you write? Do you, are you, you write fake news and so on. One of the horrifying things about 
the rise of an illiberal order is that it gives license with extraordinary rapidity to functionaries of all kinds to unleash those kinds of views. It is happening here, and it is happening now. That paradox also leads me to a broader historical speculation. About five years ago, I'm of the age now where everything happened five years ago. I'm, <laughs> it could have happened 10 years ago, and it happened five years ago. It could have happened two years ago, and it happened five years ago. But about five years ago, the Metropolitan Museum in New York put on a great show called Jerusalem 1000. Jerusalem is this city of which I have no uh, knowledge except literary knowledge, but my literary knowledge of it is relatively real. And in that show, Jerusalem 1000, the point that the curators made, somewhat to the spectator's surprise and certainly to my instruction, was that in the year 1000, the three groups in Jerusalem, Muslims, Christians, and Jews, and countless sectarian variations thereof, managed to coexist fairly well reason, with reasonable solidity, with reasonable uh, adhesion. So that there are works, there are beakers that one finds in European collections, glass beakers, where no one really knows if they were made by Christian glass blowers for, or Muslim glass blowers for a Christian European uh, market, or if they were made by Christian glass blowers and for a Muslim market. The, the interchange, the interpenetration, the complexity of those daily exchanges, what went on every day in the spice market, are such that there was a real and in its way, inspiriting practice of coexistence on view on the walls of that exhibition. Of course, we all know that 100 years later, at the time of the Crusades, that practice of social coexistence was destroyed in massacre and counter-massacre and counter-massacre counter in blood. That's a frightening picture of the risks of relying too narrowly on the picture of social capital as an antidote to the depredations of ethnic and religious nationalism. But it does point to the final feature that I wanted to raise today. And that is that the practice of coexistence, of pluralism in that base root kind that Sen and others, Olmsted and Habermas, have all analyzed and illuminated for us, that practice of coexistence is available to human beings all the time. We don't have a hard time finding instances of it throughout history, throughout the world. We find lots and lots of examples, human beings of necessity, and also because they do possess that spark of sympathy that Hume and Smith desired. Human beings generally are able to live in relative peace with other groups of human beings for long periods of time. The practice of social coexistence isn't alien to people. But all that liberal democratic institutions try and do is turn that practice of coexistence into a permanent principle of pluralism. And that turns out to be extraordinarily difficult and amazingly fragile. How can we protect it going forward? One way is to recognize that for all of its seeming solidity, the institutions of liberal democracy are, in fact, extraordinarily fragile. And we have to defend them every day, unstintingly, not on Twitter, but in the streets. And the second thing we have to remember is exactly the lesson that I was struggling to give to Olivia on that memorable and I hope not entirely tragic night. And that is that we build the values that underlie liberal democracy from the ground up. We build them in our parks. We build them in our debating societies. We build them exactly in our everyday interchanges in education, in society, on buses, and in subways with other citizens. That is the beating heart of the liberal order. I've been accused of taking all of my ideas from the Beatles. <laughs> and some of you may say that that last discant was very Beatlesque in its way. Well, I don't think I've taken all of my ideas from the Beatles, but I certainly would be unashamed to say that I have taken all my ideals from the Beatles because they seem to me fundamentally sound. And none more sound than the simple summary idea that in the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. With that simple summation and sentimental one, unapologetically so, I'd love to take your questions. Thank you. <laughs>
hand rising immediately, but I have to ask the first question. Please. <laughs> um, Please, or please. Um, Very Jewish, Bernie. <laughs> Came first, too. <laughs> uh, you can't answer it with another question. Oh, all right. Um, it's actually a reflection of what we were discussing this morning, because I, I would like you just to clarify and deepen for people what I know you believe, which is that this sentiment that you call compassion, which you see as foundational to right. liberal ideas, to liberal civilization, is also rooted in a very profound sense of our fallibility. Yes. Um, Mill, when he begins on liberty, I mean, I haven't read it in a long time, um, uh, but uh, I, re I do remember that when he begins on liberty, he actually focuses on the, limit li excuse me, on the limitations of our perception. Yes. And of our judgment. And of our judgment. None of us can have more than just a piece of the truth, right. the way he puts it, a piece of the truth. I kind of love that formulation, even though I'm, you know, it's, I think it's kind of epistemologically suspect. Weird, yes. Right. But, but, you know, we, we have a piece of the truth. Somehow, that should engender compassion. And I'd like you to riff on that a little sure. bit, because I, I guess what I'm trying to uh, help us avoid is the idea that li liberalism begins in some kind of sentimental, um, you know, some right. kind of sentimental idea that, well, if you don't have it, then you don't have to be liberal. Right. right. So I, in this book, as you know, uh, begin, and it's my credo, so I get, you know, the old Leslie Gore song, it's my party, so I'll That's cry right. if I want to. It's my credo, so I'll cry where I want to. Um, <laughs> with Montaigne rather than Montesquieu yeah. as a, the central figure. And I do that exactly because Montaigne's humanism seems to me the necessary precondition for the, the most positive sides of liberalism. So uh, Montaigne begins with the, with the understanding of the absolute limits of all human understanding and with the even deeper realization, which empowers Shakespeare shortly after, that we are all contradictory beasts. That everything we think, we also think the opposite and every desire we have, we also entertain the, uh, the, the opposite of that. Um, and from that, you begin to get a picture of the necessity of uh, avoiding dogmatic certainty on any subject. And from that, and we could talk about how that evolves in, in, in philosophical terms over time. But that's the core, I, core idea. I certainly am un, unashamed in calling it a sentiment, or even calling it sentimental, in the sense that it, in Peirce's great sense, that it simply corresponds to the feelings of an unimpeded heart. Right. What, I would, uh, what I would strongly not want to suggest, or not want to seem to be uh, imparting, is the idea that it is purely, it is an emotional uh, rather than a, a rational uh, thought. We turn to our own fallibility. Mill does this, Montaigne does it, all of the great liberal minds do it, exactly uh, not because we think that uh, everything depends on our sensibility, but because we know everyone has a different sensibility. Right. It's exactly because we recognize the variation in sensibility that we turn to neutral institutions to try and, and regulate them. That's very much Locke's argument for religious toleration. It's not that we uh, uh, Every, every idea is as good as the next idea, but that we can't possibly know what God wants us to do, and therefore, when we act as though we do, we kill each other, and right. that the killing each other can't be God's desire. We could argue that too, but, but um, I, so I think in that sense, yes, absolutely. I root my own vision of liberalism in Montaigne's fallibism, Montaigne's extreme fallibism, but I don't see that as a merely emotive or a merely uh, uh, romantic idea. It seems to me a productive idea, an irrational idea, that underlies uh, all of the activities I, I've been enumerating elsewhere. Right. So let me just make one parallel right. question around those activities, and yeah. then I'll uh, right. leave it to right. you to take over. Um, this class, uh, which is so familiar to me with students in the roads right. uh, over the years, um, is one such activity. Absolutely. You talk about uh, commonplace civilization. Right. The way we address each other in class is 
it seems to me, a kind of um, DNA for the kind of norms we assume in a democratic culture. If you know our president, if any, if any student behaved like our president in class, <laughs> we would throw him out, right? right? Not, not because we don't like what he's saying, although we may not, but because the way he's behaving, the braggadocia, the, 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 the lies, bullying, the, the, bullying, the, the, lies, the, right. the calling of names, the ways in which he conducts himself, if you had such a person like that in class, you couldn't conduct the class. So could you speak a little more about um, sure. the, the role of the university in, this, in, in creating a commonplace civilization and, and what our, our dangers of being illiberal mm -hmm. sometimes without realizing sure. what we're doing? Sure. I come, as I was saying to Bernie earlier, I come from an entirely academic family. I have five brothers and sisters. All of them have PhDs. I'm the only one in the family without a PhD. Uh, this is what we call a Jewish dropout. Um, <laughs> and... <laughs> Beg pardon? Honoraries. I have some honor honorees. don't count. Honoraries, honorees they, give, they, they pass out for free for if you show up and talk. Um, so... It's probably a telling omission that is the omission, the most telling omissions in life are the omissions of overfamiliarity. that I don't instantly go to the idea of an open university as the model of what we mean by the commonplace civilization that underlies. You don't have to address me. You can, uh... <laughs> so I think that's, that's profoundly true. The notion that we could be studying not uh, anything specifically political, but old English, that we could be studying that, but studying it in in an appropriately academic way, that is with a give or take about ideas, practices, and so on, that that's a fundamental, foundational to the broader practice of liberal democracy. We can't imagine liberal democratic institutions without institutions of learning and of higher learning underlying. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. I guess the question about Trump is not so much what would we do if Trump were a student, but what would we do if Trump were a professor? Um, or even more, what would we do if Trump was the president of the university? That's not an impossible thing to imagine, universities have had presidents, perhaps not as extreme, but not entirely unlike uh, Donald Trump. And it's required uh, a certain amount of courage on the part of faculties and students to um, eject them. Uh, so I, I think that, that that's true. The, the illiberalism, the threatened illiberalism of uh, the universities, of university practice, is one that I recognize. Many people have asked me. Uh, in the course of this very long book tour, uh, where Olivia is politically now. Uh, did I persuade her? And the truth is, is that she's gone significantly to my right. Uh, and she's gone, I, when I say to my right, I don't mean the right right, but I mean my right, a little bit to the right of a fount of progressive pieties. And that's simply because she's been exposed to uh, undue numbers of progressive pieties in her liberal education which make her suspicious of the fabric of the whole. Not reject, but suspicious. She had to do her, her uh, not an honors paper. Yeah, it was an honors paper at the end of last year on Mill and Marx. And I said, I'm not even going to look at it, baby, until you finish it. Fortunately, she came down on the side of Mill, so it, I, felt, <laughs> I felt better. Um, I will say one of the things, and I promised you I would not write a letter to my reviewers in the course of making these remarks. One of the things that many have said to me is, is that I am temperamentally too easy on the left and too rigorous on the right. But there's a simple reason for that. One is, is that liberals and leftists, though they rec represent very different trends and strands in uh, political practice, deriving from the 1860s and the Mills on the one side and Marx on the other, nonetheless have common values, common ambitions, common dreams. Uh, which they don't always share or share very little with um, ethnic authoritarians, with nationalists. But also because, and this seems to me essential, um, the values of liberal humanism, the values of liberal democracy, the institutions of liberal democracy are under daily assault from the right and are under at best rhetorical assault from the, the academic left. And that seems to me is a very important distinction to make and we should not be tempted by a false 
equivalence and failing to and failing to make that distinction. It seems to me. Nonetheless, it's you know I'm um, I I try you know it's interesting. Bernie and I, as you probably have gathered by now, we we're passing off back and forth like um, Abbott and Costello here, or maybe like Beliveau and Cornway. I'd sooner say. <laughs> But we were both raised in Canada, a country which has a much stronger tradition of uh, suppressing and eliminating hate speech than the United States does. And I have a long discussion in this book. One of my heroes, heroines, is a remarkable Canadian justice uh, in the Supreme Court of Canada. She's sort of the Canadian um, uh, Ginsburg. Her name is uh, uh, Rosie Abella. Rosie Abella, great woman. She was a displaced person. Uh, parents, Holocaust survivors in Germany, got to Canada when she was, I think, seven or eight, then went on and became probably the most admired jurist in, certainly the most admired jurist in Canada. And she's sympathetic to the idea of, Ill, of suppressing speech in the interests of the common good and the common cause. And she wrote a very strong, uh, disturbing, to some, in some degree, uh, opinion on this case. So I am a little bit more temperamentally, or perhaps I should say nationally, sympathetic to the idea that there are kinds of speech that should be uh, suppressed and advanced or not be, part, not be considered parts of the acceptable fabric of, of discourse. Uh, but I certainly think that the idea of the open university is inseparable from the idea of liberal democracy. Uh, yes. Well, lady here, lady here, and then you. Yes, please. And, and a practical matter? Yes. The f well, see, I'm not really good at the practical stuff. <laughs> I think if I have one, one thing I'd say, and you know, I wrote this book with an eye to affirming values that I hope will last beyond this political season. So out on the road, Every, and I have spoken on probably every NPR show across America, except for Car Talk, which I gather they've canceled. <laughs> and I would have spoken on that had they, had they asked me. And invariably, after they give me seven minutes tops to talk about the mills and sparks of sympathy, commonplace civilization, social capital, all those things, they say, so who do you support in 2020, right? Are you really a Warrenite or are you a Bidenite? And those are important questions, and I don't mean to scant them at all, but I, the, the end of this book and of this particular avenue of inquiry is to try and affirm values that may survive 2020. If you read my political writing in The New Yorker, you will know that I have two themes. One is get rid of guns, and then get rid of Trump. And I write get rid of guns, and I write get rid of Trump, and then next week I write get rid of guns. And oh, if you can't get rid of guns, get rid of Trump, and so on. I think that uh, the next months of our existence will be, and I say this conscious of the potential melodrama in saying this, will be vital to the survival of this republic as a republic. Because it seems to me plain that you have uh, someone who is not merely unfit, but uh, criminal in his, in his enterprises. And I deeply believe, and this is a place where I suspect I am more Buttigiegite than I am perhaps uh, Sandersist, is that it's foundational to our beliefs that we can have a liberal president or a conservative president. We can have a right-wing leader or a left-wing leader. I feel passionately about which kind I want, but I accept that that oscillation is necessary. We can have uh, a uh, free market in Randite, if uh, uh, in we have had, and I would hope that we will have a socialist president someday, and perhaps even someday soon. What we can't have is a gangster. That's the one thing we can all agree on. We cannot have a gangster president. And that's the circumstance that we're in right now. So that's my, my strong political belief. How we bring that political belief to fruition is another question. One of the rich veins, I think, of thinking about the history of liberalism as a living uh, uh, practice, not just as a set of abstract ideas, is to think about the relationship between social activism, public activism, taking to the streets, and uh, uh, liberal democratic institutions. And they have a complicated, very complicated interchange. One of the heroes of this book is a now unduly forgotten figure, and that's Bayard Ruskin, who was the great organizer of the March on Washington, the man who organized the March on Washington. He was black and he was gay, where you were there. And he, he used to joke, he said, I've been arrested in prison 25 times in my life, 24 times for being African-American, once for being a homosexual. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> and uh, Rustin, and, and people say to me occasionally in a meeting like this, um, well, Rustin wasn't really a liberal. He was a socialist. Well, he was off and on. But he deeply believed in the constant interaction of public demonstrations in the most literal kind, marching on Washington, and then seeing that the social capital accumulated by those public demonstrations expended in legislation in those liberal democratic institutions. And he understood that even at their most resistant, and we, and we underestimate just how resistant those democratic institutions were in the 1950s and early 1960s to the cause of civil rights, that that's the, those are the necessary steps. And I hope we all have the courage and the persistence to continue to pursue both. What I would add, and this is what makes me a liberal, I think, rather than a leftist, and where Rustin and where I learned from Rustin, is that without those liberal institutions, without the possibility of parliamentary reform in all of its squalor and compromised ugliness, that those changes will not take place. We've only had to look at Iran, for instance, in recent years to see the power of social activism and its absolute impotence in the absence of uh, of real uh, democratic institutions. Iran's a fascinating place in terms of, you know, I was talking about coffee houses. A moment ago, I forgot to add this. This is what happens when you speak extemporaneously. You drop a couple of beats. It sounds sort of slightly absurd when Jurgen Habermas or someone like me says, coffee houses are essential to the practice of liberal democracy. It sounds like a kind of sentimental platitude. In fact, if you just look at what's happened in Tehran over the past year, the religious police have closed, I think it's 524 coffee houses, exactly because those are places where women can go and not feel compelled to wear Islamic dress, where women can go and claim their own identity. They don't talk politics. They say, we don't do anything except drink coffee and, and act among ourselves. And the religious police recognize what a profound threat that is to the continuation of theocratic rule, that those women in a coffee house are dynamite to the continuation of theocratic rule, and they're closing them down day after day. So it's not a sentimental conception. It's a profound one. And in the absence to date of those liberal democratic institutions, it's not possible, easily possible to go from social action to real social change. Oh, gentlemen here, yes. Yes, Mr. Goff, right. uh, in your talk, you spoke about offset uh, characterization of commonplace culture and about the importance of the Commonplace civilization, yes, commonplace, indeed. Commonplace uh, civilization, my bad. And uh, the importance of uh, the importance of the university as having a central right. role in propagating liberal democratic values. Before I ask you my question, I will say while waiting for you, I was listening to some Queen, so this <laughs> will make a lot more sense in the next five right. seconds. In the of the American Nine, Alan Bloom talks about he points out the deterioration of our commonplace civilization, especially at the university level, where we've replaced and we are slowly replacing what is was fine, was beautiful. Let's say, for example, to pick the analogy he does, we replace Brahms with, I don't know, Eminem? And well, the Beatles are the ones I, I cited, so we can call them. <laughs> ah, all right, yes, we don't want yes. You know, that's right. what I'm saying. No right. one's ever made perfect, but like, we're really going down the slippery slope in terms of you know, replacing in our own commonplace civilization at the university that, what's beautiful, that which is beautiful, for that which, uh, that which is purely easily accessible and easily and immediately understandable. How, how do you think that this can affect the propagation of you know, the liberal democratic values that you so, uh, you so primarily hold? And how does this affect the foundations of our culture as a whole? And sure. Our this is a terrific question. I will add, you know, speaking of Alan Bloom was not a, a, a high prestige name when I was growing up in my family. But my son uh, has gone on in philosophy, and he's become a Straussian. Indeed, he's a Heideggerian. Um, <laughs> So it just goes to show you that even within one family, a broad range of opinion is possible. Where I would disagree with Bloom is in, you know, I did my graduate work abortively in art history. And one thing, yeah, oh really, good for, you, good for you. Well, one of the things we learn is that ideas of the beautiful are endlessly mutable. What counts as beautiful in any one time or any one culture changes all the time. It's particularly, it's always particularly, um, touching for me when uh, people on the, uh, what I think of as the theocratic right, argue for the existence of God through the uh, persistence of beauty, right? Nothing is as historically conditioned as the rediscovery of Gothic art by, in the 19th century by, by the West. You can go point by point about how a set of arguments reignited 
the possibility of looking at Gothic cathedrals as superior to, not just predecessors to, antecedents to Renaissance architecture and so on. So it seems to me that there's no question that there's, uh, uh, that what will count as beautiful at any one time, and Bloom is an authoritarian, he doesn't want to uh, concede this, will necessarily change from period to period. What I'd say, and I say this at some point in the book, is that we're always being given the false choice between authority and anarchy. If we don't accept the authority of a particular canon of beauty, or we don't accept the authority of a particular standard of taste, then we have nothing but anarchy, right? Then, every, then we have anarchy in what uh, conservatives like to call relativism, one of the worst things liberals are. They're relativists. They're secularists as well. They're also permissive. Uh, it seems to me that between anarchy and authority lies argument, and that's the liberal position, is that all of those things, the relative superiority of Brahms over the Beatles, much less over Eminem, are not uh, black boxes that we have no views on. They're all things not only that we can argue about, but we can't help but argue about. Of all the things I've always thought was the single most fatuous platitude in the realm of flat, fatuous platitudes is that there's no arguing about taste. That's all people argue about. <laughs> it's all people argue about when they're actually arguing, when they're actually arguing from the depths of their being, not arguing rhetorically for the sake. All we argue about is taste. Who do you like more, the Beatles or the Stones? That was the great argument of our, of our youth. I won't, who do you like more, the Canadians or the Bruins? It's beyond argument, I would say. <laughs> but between, the liberal answer is between authority, as Bloom demands it, and anarchy, as we're told, uh, his enemies demanded, lies the practice of argument, which is in its nature, this is Mill's point over and over, is inconclusive. Argument is inconclusive, but that doesn't mean argument is not productive. And that would be my response uh, to that too. Gentlemen here, yeah. up here. Yeah, and then as, a, as, a, um, as a lifelong uh, supporter of the Toronto Maple Leafs from Canada, <laughs> I nonetheless uh, thank you very much. One question, do you think that those roots of uh, civilization that are so deep uh, can be sustained in the uh, current uh, digital multimedia environment in which we live. <laughs> ter terrific question. In fact, of all the uh, questions that keep circulating around, that's probably the single one I hear most often and, and uh, don't deal with, to be perfectly frank, at very, very, uh, any real length in the book. Uh, and it's true that it's a central paradox of our time, isn't it, right? When, when the internet first rose, it seemed self-evident that it would be a means of planet, it would be a form of planetary adhesive. How could it not be? That it would build social capital rather than destroy it. How, how could it fail to do it? Since social capital depends on, essentially on strangers sitting down, that's what we mean by social capital, strangers sitting down together. When have we ever had so many strangers so far removed sitting down at such length? And yet just the opposite seems to have happened, right? That instead of building social capital, it turns out to be a, a, a toxin. It turns out to be acidic corrosive of social capital. Uh, that's uh, a truth about our time that, is going, that takes a lot of thinking, and I don't pretend to have a good answer to it. I wrote a piece about five years ago called The Information, where I tried to take on this question. Uh, and so it's sort of my codicil or my preliminary to this book. And one of the things that struck me in doing the reading, uh, in reading the, the literature on it, is, and I, I hesitate to say this because it can sound unduly complacent, but I think it's an important light to throw in it. At any moment in the history of modernity, whatever the most uh, visible current technology, uh, whatever the most visible current communications technology was, has gotten all the blame for everything that is going on. And I am old enough to remember the height of the empire of television which in retrospect now is clearly it was a tiny wrinkle in time that really extended from 1954 to 1994, really. It's 40 years when television had that kind of broadcast television. Even cable television had that kind of dominance. But at the height of its power, all the things we ascribe to the digital technology now were ascribed to television. It breaks our attention span. It serves as a drug rather than a means of education. Uh, it makes it impossible to have extended argument because it breaks uh, argument down into tiny visual and rhetorical fragments. Every single argument that you hear now about digital technology was said about television. There are books now for the, you know, philosophical books, arguments for the deconstruction of the internet, and there were books, arguments for the abolition of television 
in the same way. Now, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in this thing, only parent who has gone into a teenager's room and said, would you please get off your damn computer and come watch television with the rest of the family? <laughs> because the computer seems to us an atomizing uh, a thing. So the one, I don't know the answer to that, and it'll be one of the most interesting things that we will watch in the next 50 years. But I think that the historical lesson generally tends to be that we overrate the power of the, whatever the technology is that's threatening us. This gentleman here and then here. If, if you had the opportunity next week to speak at Ole Miss right. or at the University of South Carolina or Arkansas, how would you alter what you would tell them and discuss with them versus what you've done with us up here in northern New Hampshire? Great question, and I have actually, um, I've not been to Arkansas, but I've been in Oklahoma and I've been in Nebraska. And uh, basically what I try and say is the same things I'm saying in northern New Hampshire in an Ivy League school, only uh, nicer. <laughs> <laughs> I think the idea that there are liberal democratic institutions worth preserving, that those liberal democratic institutions are largely responsible, responsible for our living in societies that with all of their terrible inequities and all of their terrible injustices, and those are not trivial and are not to be passed over in a phrase, but nonetheless are the most prosperous and pluralistic societies that humankind has ever seen, that that depends on the persistence of those institutions. And I say when I am before a hostile audience or in Naples, Florida, where Malcolm Gladwell and I were nearly lynched um, not that long ago, I make the point that I made a moment ago, that we can, that from the depth of our being, we believe that a plurality of opinions is a very good thing, and it's an essential thing. And even when we desperately disagree with a specific opinion, the one, of course, that always comes up in, these, uh, in those colloquies is gun control. I'm a passionate advocate for Canadian-style gun control, and that receives a hostile reception at most of those places. But even if we have those profound differences, we can say we can accept the idea of liberal leaders, conservative leaders, right-wing right -wing opinions and left-wing opinions. What we can't accept is the idea of tyranny. What we can't accept is the idea of a gangster government, and that we can distinguish a gangster government from a government by people we disagree with, that that's a fundamental distinction. And I rarely have a hard time selling that, that idea to, to any rational audience. They think I'm a... Uh, you know, a uh, New York liberal elitist Jew, nonetheless. But that <laughs> distinction, they they generally buy. Yes. Now, I want to say something about um, the media first, and then get to my question. Uh, I believe that the internet, as an educator and as someone who uh, does online edition of John Milton right. and so forth, has realized a good deal of the promise that we were talking about in 1996. Remember, this, the, the people launched the same accusation against newspapers because what? newspapers, when they started out, were entirely um, uh, party-driven. Right. So, so I, I just, just to add as a brief and one of my favorite instances of this, the, you know, the, the predecessors to the evil of the internet, Anne Blair, the historian, makes the point that the index was seen as the internet of 1550 or whatever, it was 1600, yeah. because people said, look, this awful index, right? It breaks everything down into these little bits. No one's going to read the whole book through anymore. They'll just turn to the index and look for their own names, which is true. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yes, so we can always find those. The original, right. the original vanity, uh, vanity Google. Yeah. Um, but um, uh, I think it's incumbent upon us, particularly in education, to, uh, to continue to realize the Back to commonplace civilization. Thank you for bringing up Frederick Law Olmsted, with whom we share a birthday. Oh, <laughs> I got a whole book out of Lincoln and Darwin sharing a birthday, so you can get a memoir out of yours. Um, but it seems to me, and I'm, I'm sure I'm not going to say anything that you haven't already thought of, but I, but I haven't heard it today. There are serious prerequisites to commonplace civilization, social capital, not being hungry, like uh, not being persistently and traumatically threatened physically and uh, emotionally day in and day out. And the one I'm most concerned with is not being uneducated. In this fragile uh, uh, commonplace civilization, uh, the, fragile, the fragility of liberal dem democracy 
tell you, we have been incredibly careless when it comes to education. Even at institutions like this very place, we have, we, we have perpetuated a class of elite, and elite educated people that belong to it. We all do. And, and, and we have not done, and people, can, people who are hungry and are traumatically threatened and who are ill-educated, including our president, by the way, um, how that happens is another issue. And he went to Penn. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, people in those situations but. listen to what you're saying if they ever get a chance to hear it or read it or find a New Yorker lying around somewhere. Um, they say, what utter bull? Well, let me answer you in a, couple of different, in, in a couple of different ways. One, let me give the reason I gave the example of Iceland, uh, which perhaps I didn't explain well enough, is that Iceland is a good example of a country with no natural resources to speak of. In fact, where they, there was almost at one point a complete exodus of the uh, population of Iceland, not that long ago. That's why they all came to Canada. For that very reason, because there was widespread famine, the ports got, got iced in and so on. Why does Iceland thrive now as a tiny but very powerful model of liberal democratic values. Because they got educated, because they began to invest in, in education. And Sen's point throughout all of it, the economist Sen's point throughout, all, throughout everything is, is that those things are not the ornamentation, the fortunate encrustation that we get as the result of development. They are the precondition, the prerequisite for development. And Iceland is a beautiful illustration of that. If you ever go to Iceland and you go on a tour of the island, They'll take you around. Oh, this is the place where we used to drown all the heretics, right? And this is the place where we used to execute the, um, the losing family in a civil war. We got rid of all of them, right? So the most brutal imaginable practices and the, and the most unimaginable uh, uh, famines and, and assaults were part of the fabric of Icelandic life. And then, beginning with the liberal revolutions of the late 19th century in Iceland, they got their independence from the Danes, and education became the central right of an Icelandic existence, highest literacy rate in the world, as my wife will tell you over and over and over again. Uh, so the, I couldn't agree more. And I was persuaded by my daughter to put in practical recommendations at the end of the book, uh, because she felt that the book, when she read the manuscript and had it to, was wonderfully high-minded, but too high-minded. She wanted it to have practical stuff at the end as well. So for her. You'll see if you read the book, you'll see that at one point we were um, biking together in a, in a beach town, and she saw a sign that said, uh, in this house, all humans are created equal, no immigrant is an alien, uh, kindness is everything, and love conquers all. And she said to me, Dad, there's your whole book as, you, <laughs> as you've done it. So I did try to put in some uh, uh, propositions, and the primary one is the necessity of public education. You know, I was joking about my father uh, at the beginning having, you know, learned about people's insecurities from having worked in a university for 40 years. It's the, where you get primary instruction on the power of human insecurity. But my father was the son of um, genuinely, I mean, they could read a little Yiddish, but basically illiterate uh, immigrants. I mean, he couldn't speak, he couldn't read English. Couldn't read English. And he went to a public high school in Philadelphia, and then he worked his way, when you still could, worked his way through Penn, as it happens, and, and spent his life as a professor of 18th century English literature. That's an exceptional, by no means a unique tale of, of people of that generation. It depended on there being a superb public high school in Philadelphia that he could go to. The, the corruption, the corrosion of our public educational institutions is of any one thing the most important. If there's one correlation, apart from the correlation of social capital with um, uh, democratic strength, the one correlation as I read, as I reported this book, that's most powerful is the relationship between pre-K education and social inequality. If you get kids into school, not in kindergarten, but before kindergarten, you have universal pre-K, social inequality reduces, economic inequality reduces almost, almost magically. That's the kind of work that we have to be doing. So coming back to your question, that's kind of long range work we certainly have to be doing. I've often said, heretically, but I believe it to be true, that if I were mayor, if they appointed me dictator of New York, mayor of New York is not very powerful, 
But if they appointed me dictator of New York tomorrow, the first thing I would do is abolish private schools in New York so that all, um, all of us elitists, right, both intellectual and economic, would have to send their kids to public schools. And you would see the public schools in New York City improve with such rapidity that it would, be, it would, be, it would astonish you, right? So if, we had, if everybody had to do that, right? So that, I think, is, is foundational to it. And there's one thing, and again, I, you know, I can't say this passionately enough because it's true. Those things are not the consequences of abundance. They are the preconditions of abundance. And just one last point on famine. One of the other interesting things that, that uh, I think it's said, maybe it's someone else, points out is, is that democracies with all of their flaws and faults don't have famines. They don't have famines. Autocracies have famines. China has had catastrophic famines. India, with all of its difficulties, has not had famines since independence over the last uh, 60 years. And it's in part because you have the feedback mechanisms that are essential uh, to prevent that from happening. Uh, can I take one more? Uh, you can, we can go till 6, but you're going to take one more from me. All right, OK. So let me take one more from the crowd, and then I'll go back to Bernie land. Yes. Yes, please. A moment ago, you mentioned that we could have a socialist president in the future. And I just wanted to ask, like, um, it seems like which political system could best support the common choice civilization that you mm -hmm. talked about isn't a closed question. But is it really possible for socialism to work with bottom-up, day-to-day, common place civilization values that you mentioned in your talk? And sure. I, you know, again, uh, um, if you have the peculiarity of having grown up in Canada, where social democratic governments are commonplace, you recognize that they are not a threat to civilization, right? Uh, uh, you know, one of the things that I think in one of the idiosyncrasies, eccentricities of this book is it seems to me the great social democratic tradition is much better seen as part of the legacy of the Mills more than even than the legacy of Marx. And that's Mill sat in parliament as a socialist, John Stuart Mill did. For exactly those, uh, for those reasons, uh, it seems to me you know one of my favorite instances I think I pointed out in the book is that before the um, Labor Party came to power in Britain in 1945, Hayek, the great uh, economist and thought about this, wrote *The Road to Serfdom*, saying you can't have both social equality, socialist government without serfdom, without uh, the enslavement of the individual imagination, individual uh, liberty to the state. And that turned out to be completely untrue, that you could nationalize the railroads and still publish your own newspaper. That just isn't the way that it, there is no connection between those two things. And I think that that's been true. So I think that it's perfectly possible to have social democratic governments that have very, even richer kinds of, uh, of, uh, of uh, commonplace civilization. And because you can clinch any point with the Beatles, I'll say that you know, one of the things that's worth remembering is the Beatles all grew up in social housing, in public projects. That's where they grew up. That's where they played their instruments. That's where they met. Because the Attlee government, the socialist government of labor government, had seen that as a necessity, building public, building public housing. That was, where, that was the cockpit the, where that kind of enterprise could take place. Not, I'm, I'm sweetening the pot a little bit here. It's a little <laughs> bit more complicated than that. But essentially, that's, that's true. So I, I just wanted to Mr. leave Edge. us with a slight tinge of optimism. Um, Trump resigned while we were in here. <laughs> <laughs> I d since you invoke Jerusalem, yes. where Sidra and I spend six months of a year, When I finished reading your book and, and, and you were uh, talking about commonplace civilization, I, kept, I immediately wanted to call you and did and said, Tel Aviv. Yes. Um, that civilization actually, of course, has its roots in the word city. Mm -hmm. And there is a. Um, an obvious connection between urbanization and the evolution of the kinds of social frictions that lead to the kinds of insights that you're valorizing. Right. Absolutely. It's a city thing. There's no it's, question. It's a city thing. Can we not take a certain amount of hope, as I take, as I watch Tel Aviv grow and Jerusalem, which has become a little orthodox 
uh, shtetl <laughs> kind of uh, grow smaller by comparison. Trick. Yes, right. Can we not take a certain amount of hope from the idea that the inevitable trends towards urbanization, with all of the exurban results of the technology and, 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 and social media and so on, that as we, the cities grow, we will inevitably be creating institutional seedbeds sure. for what you're talking about and, and understand that the, this difference between the coasts and Oklahoma. I'm sure the part in Oklahoma that invited you was a city. I mean, <laughs> the city, yes. Yeah, but the city. The city. Right. Um, that somehow we we are moving, trending toward that kind of thing, almost irrespective of what we do. Not that we shouldn't write articles and and argue for it and so on. But yes, you I you know I think that that's you know. First, on, this, on the urban-rural divide, there was a very good um, study just published, I think, in Foreign Affairs, something like that, that making the point that the great divide, Brexit, Trump, uh, the gilets jaunes uh, in France, right across the great divide is not uh, uh, ethnic, not even generational so much as it is rural-urban, that we're living through kind of the last rural revolt. Uh, in modern history right now, and that's really the nature of what we're living through. It's the last pitchfork rebellion uh, is what we're, what we're experiencing. It was very persuasive and well argued and well documented. Things. So I think not only is it historically true, I think it's, it's specifically true of this time. Um, uh, just to re return to the, the theme, uh, you know, I, I think that it's, there's a constant race between those two sets of things. You know, I remember in your book, Bernie, the Hebrew Republic, you make this case very passionately that Within Israel itself, with all of the, the uh, hideously negative things that you decry, the practices of coexistence and of pluralism were growing up sort of willy-nilly, whether outside of anybody's desire, because it's the nature of the world, the nature of a human appetite mm. for coexistence. I was, in my previous, returning to my previous avatar as a writer on food, I was hugely uh, encouraged, probably falsely, by the Otto Lenghi recipe book, Jerusalem, which presents exactly a kind of little mini paradise of coexistence of cuisines as a model for the coexistence of, of peoples. I chose to believe that that was true, but you've told me that it's a little bit of a, of a, of a, of a fantasy. Nonetheless, it's, it's true. When we go to eat, you know, uh, shakshuka, to whom does it belong, right? That's a, those, are, those, are, those are reasonable questions. I'd return to my earlier point, and I can't imagine that there's any place in which one would feel this more um, vividly than in Israel. The human appetite for the practice of coexistence is clearly very powerful and indeed planetary. One might almost say permanent. The, our ability to turn that into a working set of principles of pluralism is extraordinarily fragile historically. In Israel, in America, around the world and throughout history. It is a challenge that will never go away. It is, it is a fight that we will never stop having. The plague will always return, <laughs> inevitably, as Camus said. And all we can do is doctor each generation. Stop there, maybe. Thank yeah. you.